Um, our next speaker, by the way, this whole session is being sponsored by the Independent Institute. And our next speaker is Benjamin uh, Powell, who is a senior fellow at the Independent Institute, director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University, go Red Raver, Raiders, um, author of more than 50 scholarly studies and editor of the books uh, housing America, Building Out of a Crisis, and the one I like a lot, Making Poor Nations Rich, Entrepreneurship and the Process of Economic Development, uh, Benjamin Powell. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. And, and, and I'm pleased to be here with you all today to, to talk about this, uh, in part because uh, of around 20 years later, uh, it gives me some justification for spending four years of my life taking Latin courses in, in middle school and high school that I've so far found no use for whatsoever. Uh, it gave me a little bit of Roman history, but as I butcher the people's names when I talk about things in the coming minutes, you're going to learn exactly what type of a student I was in high school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, David Thoreau asked me on, on this panel uh, to, to, to plug the book, Making Poor Nations Rich, and, and to talk about that, but... Uh, as well to tie it to the theme of the conference, Are We Rome, and talk about Roman history and the future of the United States. So in roughly 12 slides and nine minutes remaining, uh, that's what I propose to do. So to start off with the, the theme on, on making poor nations rich, basically the, the theme for the talk is pr prosperity and growth here, what is necessary? And this is an audience that doesn't need to hear this, this part of the talk, so I'll be very brief. If we need strong property rights, we need economic freedoms, we need the rule of law. You put that in place and countries grow. Look around the world, any place that has it, you find wealth or wealth creation. Any place that doesn't have it, you find poverty. That's the bottom line. And the message of the book, incidentally, by the way, is a series of case studies of different countries around the world, some who have made dramatic reforms, moving towards free markets and the growth that came from it, others who have stagnated in poverty and the statism that they em embrace. Uh, and to, to one chapter in the book that kind of summarizes this is the one that Robert Lawson did, which looks using the Economic Freedom Index across the world and shows basically, yes, freer countries are wealthier, they grow faster, and basically pick any other living statistic that you would like, and they do better on it. Uh, that's the, the main message of the book, and we will be doing a book signing, I think, at the Independent Institute's booth out wherever that lobby area is from here, uh, immediately after the, the panel. Now what I'd like to do is tie that message then for this audience that probably basically gets that to, to Roman history and, and the United States today. Uh, and I, I think the title of this session was like No More Caesars, uh, which I couldn't resist sticking a Caesar up there anyway, uh, mostly because PowerPoints are nice with pictures and it's hard to get many pictures from ancient Rome that aren't emperors. Uh, but this is uh, Octavian. So under the early empire, ancient Rome actually largely embraced economic freedom. Uh, they had moderately secure property rights. They had free international trade. Customs duties were on the order of 5% or so. Taxes, they had a very uh, regressive, not progressive, regressive tax system. Uh, each province had to contribute a certain amount of basically loot to Rome. Uh, and then individual citizens, they had a head tax, uh, which is a real flat tax, not like a Steve Forbes version of a flat tax of X percent. It's more like you're alive, you owe 5,000 bucks, period. You made a million, you still owe 5,000 which means that as you earn more and more, it gave you great incentive too because the government wasn't taking it away. Uh, and what happened under this time period, and this is roughly the first hundred years of empire, the end of republic stage, is they had some decent economic growth taking place. It's hard, of course, measuring economic growth is problematic anywhere, and particularly probably in ancient times. Uh, but anecdotal evidence, I mean, it, the People who go discovering shipwrecks and stuff find all of a sudden during this period there's tons of different ships that they discover that wrecked. Well, it tells you that there was a lot of trade going on compared to prior errors and what came afterwards. But basically, this was a time of prosperity in Rome. Uh, but then what happened is you got out to the maximum extent of the empire a little after 100 AD. Uh, Trajan was the, the, the Caesar at that time. Um, and Rome had been expanding and not taxing its citizens very much and not debasing its currency very much, but largely the bureaucracy was growing, the military was growing. It was getting a big government, but the way it financed it was basically theft of other people that they conquered. Once you got out to the maximum extent of the empire, there was no one else to steal from to bring the loot back to Rome. Uh, and that's the stage that they got to here just a, around after 100 AD. And then it became problematic for the government of how are we going to finance this. And they turned to one of government's favorite methods of doing so, which is debasing the currency. So Nero was in that first century, and he took 
uh, the denarius, the, the coin Stossel held up last night, and took it down from 100% silver content to 90%. Um, Trajan, at the extent of the empire, brought it down to 85%. So in terms of how we're talking about inflation, it's relatively moderate over, over the last 50 years during that first century. Uh, but then it starts accelerating as they don't have extra loot to capture, basically. Uh, and you see in the late second century, it's down to 75%. By the mid-third century, it's down to 5%. And then, and this is what I, because John held up one of the Trajan coins last night. It's like, hey, that's a good one, man. That's 85%. It got to, down to one five thousandth of a percent of the silver of the original coin by AD 270. What's that? Yeah, and actually, actually, it gets worse because then it got to zero. So the, 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 the reform that came after this was a fiat currency. The, comment, the question was, what was the rest? So it was mixing with other, other metals to debase it and also shrinking. By the way, I don't know if this is still true. I, don't, I lived in D.C. for a while when I was in graduate school, and I, like, hate going to things in D.C. because everything's like a monument to the state. And, and they don't move. Uh, so it's really bad when people come to visit you and you see the same thing again and again and again. Anyway, the Smithsonian is one of like, the exceptions that I'd go to, and they have an exhibit in there of, of currency over time. If not mistaken, they had the Roman currency in there, the denarius, and you can see it through time. Not only does it get debased, it changes size, and it just keeps shrinking, and they've got this, but it's not just for Rome. They've got it for basically every country in the world is a history of currency debasement, and you just see the coins shrink. John should like tape that for his show and, and put that in there as a lead-in. Uh, so what happens then uh, as the inflation is taking hold? Uh, Diocletian is the, is the emperor who comes in at the end of that century, and he introduces a fiat currency uh, made of, I think it was bronze and copper mix or something like that, uh, that goes by the name denarius but doesn't even claim to have any silver content to it. Uh, and, of course, what he gets within four years is 250% inflation because he continues to mint more and more of this at the same time. And his answer, like many misguided politicians, price controls. If prices are going up, it's the greedy capitalists who are doing this. We just need to pass a law. And when he passed a law, he put it on about a 1,000 different things, basically anything that was traded in Rome, including labor, put a price ceiling on it, and then they made it punishable by death. If you traded at a higher price, whether you were the buyer, the seller, or for that matter, if you had goods and didn't bring them to market, you could be killed. After a bunch of bloodshed, uh, actually a lot of it was due to riots around the shortages, not necessarily the government executing the people, they eventually pulled these price controls away. But it's reminiscent of governments throughout the last 2,000 years have done price controls in response to their own debasing of the currency. The United States, to the Are We Rome thing, is certainly no exception. When Nixon closes the gold window in 71, we get a decade of high inflation. And what do we see? Universal wage and price controls. Uh, luckily, he wasn't quite as dedicated to it as Diocletian, so it wasn't punishable by death. Uh, that said, it still made long gas lines and a lot of other misery. Uh, so following his reforms then, uh, there was a, in the following century, century a 2,000% inflation. So this just continued in Rome. Um, and eventually they got to a, a command economy, basically, uh, where they had very high taxes levied in kind because their monetary economy was collapsing, so they just went and requisitioned stuff from people and gave it to others. Uh, then they kind of codified how they were doing that, and they found then that people didn't want to work. Big surprise. And, uh, so they passed a law that said, whatever profession you were in, you must stay in that profession and can't change to something else. And in fact, your kid has to be in that profession too, and we command you to produce. Uh, and then we can steal from you. Uh, not surprisingly, or actually maybe surprisingly, because most people think of the fall of Rome as like being bad for Roman citizens. We think of it as like the great civilization. Actually, I think people who think of like great civilizations basically have like a, a, a pile of crap notion of history. If you pile up a bunch of stuff and it's there 2,000 years later, oh, that must be a great civilization. The way people lived under this was poor. It was horrible for most of them. In fact, there's many cases of Roman citizens leaving the Roman Empire to go live with the so-called barbarians because it was better than their oppressive state. Uh, <laughs> so when the fall of Rome came, and the historians aren't known for their like, libertarian leanings. Uh, it's an understatement, Anthony knows. Uh, but there's no shortage of historians when you read the time when they say, when the Roman Empire finally collapsed, the average Roman citizen's life didn't get any worse. The government was gone. The big you know, gladiator battles were gone, but they got rid of their oppressive state, and they were basically already living a subsistence kind of feudal life in response to the government's command control economy. People were pledging themselves as serfs and slaves to others on the state. So when the whole thing collapsed, it wasn't that bigger deal for your average citizen. Um, and this is 
said by historians. So really quickly then, are we Rome to tie it to that? This is the demise of the dollar since 1913. It takes $23 to buy what $1 could in 1913. Since 71, when the, the gold window closed, it takes $6 to buy what $1 could. Um, so in proportion to, well, actually, in terms of the history of the United States of just a little over a couple hundred years, maybe we're on an accelerated Rome path because they lasted a bit longer than that. Um, but in proportion to what eventually came in, no, we're not. And I think Pete's three-horse race thing is actually a great analogy. In, in Rome, the horse of innovation and markets was not the same as what it is in the United States. And part of that's cultural, actually, because like traders and people engaged in markets were looked down upon compared to people in military and, and government, whereas the United States more or less is still appreciative of entrepreneurs, uh, at least when phrased correctly, uh, and the value that they cre create for society. And... We are not turning down like Rome as long as those first two horses outrun his, his third horse. Unfortunately, that third horse is galloping in the United States right now, and, and that's the real problem. Uh, it's not just the monetary unit being debased. The, the main story is the demise of economic freedom in the United States. As recently as 2000, as we measure these things across countries, the United States was the second largest free market economy in the world. Excuse me, the second freest economy in the world and the largest. Hong Kong was the other, only other one. We've fallen to 18th on that index now, and when the new one comes out in the fall, I expect that it's going to continue to plummet because actually the thing's based off like a two-year lag. If the rate of decline has stayed the same as it was the previous two years, we'd be down to number 44 right now hanging out with people like Panama. Uh, I don't think that's probably the case because a lot of this is in response to the 2008 crisis. Uh, all the same, when we look at it, it's pretty much across the board that freedom's been declining in the United States. So the size of government is growing. The legal structure and property rights, and this is a really depressing one, is plummeting. And by the way, for all of the Obama haters out there, which I'm, I'm with you, but I hate all of our Caesars in the United States, uh, a lot of this came under George Bush. So more than half of the decline in economic freedom happened under Bush's eight years compared to Obama's. Obama's basically just done what Bush did and stuck it on steroids, so it's going a little, like, twice as fast. <laughs> uh, but the, the principle of it all, we, like, we have to end the laissez-faire Hoover interventionist FDR myth. We can't let a story be told that, oh, it's interventionist Obama, Bush wasn't doing it. No, Bush was doing it all, Obama scaled it up. Uh, but destruction of property rights in the United States... Uh, Amazingly, the only one of these that doesn't go down is monetary, and that's because it's measured by inflation rather than actually Federal Reserve creation, so it hasn't made it into the price level yet. Uh, freedom to trade internationally, a little bit down. Regulation, a little bit down. Basically, our freedoms are declining. So uh, Robert uh, Lucas, a famous economist, said once you start thinking about growth, it's hard to think about anything else. And he had previously done a lot of work on business cycles. And it's true, business cycles are just blips in a trend line. Economists spend a disproportionate amount of time about those blips, the important thing is the trend line. Unfortunately, what's happened is the latest blip in the business cycle has engendered a policy response of the United States government that changes our trend line. And people are talking about the slow recovery. No, we're looking at the slow reality. Is basically our institutions have got worse, and now we should expect a long-term long growth trend that's much flatter and looks like what's happening today. So it's not failure to recovery. It's failure to maintain the institutions that give us long-run prosperity. That doesn't mean that the empire is about to collapse, but it does mean that our future growth trend is not as bright as it would have been in the past. Although if ours does, hopefully like the Romans, our life will be better afterwards. Thank you.